Hey guys, over the last couple of years, I've had loads of people ask me how they can support the show, and now you can. So if you like this show and you want to support it and you want to keep it free, head on over to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. Thanks for all you do. If you're a business owner and you want to increase your cash flow, or if you're a label or artist and you want to promote new music, then listen up. For information about advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, including information on geographically targeted ads, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey guys, I got to tell you a quick story. I recently put in a pair of EMG pickups into my Les Paul Classic and tinkering with electronics, wires, not my bag. That being said, a little over an hour later, I'd install the pickups with literally no problems at all. And the quality of the sound is absolutely amazing. I put in the retroactive Fat 55s. That's a new set that they have. And that's because I wanted a vintage, you know, British brown sound. And these Fat 55s are modeled after the tone of the classic PAFs which is exactly what I got. The thing I wasn't expecting is it sort of feels like my volume and tone knobs have been expanded to 20. There's like a lot more responsiveness in the volume and tone, and I could even get harmonics now at low volumes on the neck pickup, and any preconceived notions I had about installation being difficult or, you know, there's a problem having a battery in there were totally wrong. The the battery thing, it's like putting a battery in one of my kids' toys when they were little children growing up. It's just a total non-issue. And in fact, I'm going to wind up getting the Strat set next because installation for that is even easier because it comes with the pick guard and the, the uh, pickup's already attached to the pick guard. And if you want to check out EMGs for yourself, now is actually a great time to do this because Rob and Allison are making making a special offer available for listeners of this show only. And and here it is. For a limited time, head on over to emgpickups.com, buy one or more sets of pickups, and enter ELG in the discount code section of the shopping cart. ELG, of course, for Everyone Loves Guitar. And they're going to give you 15% off, which is huge. The biggest discounts they ever give is 10%. Plus, they're going to give away $70 worth of free bonuses, including an EMG cinch bag, a pick tin, lanyard, stickers, and a t-shirt. Plus, you get a money-back guarantee if you're not 100% satisfied. Plus, not a two-year performance guarantee on the performance of the actual pickups themselves, but a lifetime performance guarantee. And on top of everything else, you're going to get free shipping. So there's basically no risk at all here for you to try a set or two of EMG pickups. And the great thing about these pickups is, and I got two sets, once you install them, and by the way, there's no soldering involved at all, because I couldn't have done it if there was, quite frankly. But once you do install them, all you need to do to swap them out and put another set in is literally disconnect one wire on each pickup, and then you're done. That's it. It's kind of like putting Legos together. It's that easy. So go to emgpickups.com, enter ELG in the shopping cart for your discount code, and that's it. You get to take advantage of this offer right now. Man, this one's always a big challenge. If you want to buy or sell a home or investment property and you're here in the Tampa Bay area, in Hillsborough, Pinellas, or Pasco counties, then listen up. West Florida Real Estate is a local residential real estate broker that's helped over 250 Bay Area homeowners buy and sell their properties in the last four years alone. If you're looking to sell, you'll want to get their free report, the seven biggest mistakes homeowners make when hiring a realtor. And if you're looking to buy a property, you definitely want to get your hands on the 21 most expensive mistakes Tampa home buyers make when buying a home. Each one of these reports is going to save you time and money. Inside, you'll discover the seven most important things to consider when hiring a realtor, what to do if you're buying and selling a home at the same time, and the danger of choosing a realtor who agrees with everything you say. To get your hands on these free reports, head on over to westfloridarealestate.com. That's westfloridarealestate.com. The Be Fulfilled Journal helps you be more honest with yourself and with others and be more open to handling things you've avoided dealing with for years. It's a 12-week online and journal program that helps you identify and eliminate things you do that are causing you stress and live in more gratitude and joy. 
It was actually developed by a long-term friend of mine who got sober in 2008, and he's put together a great deal just for my listeners. You get the 300-page hardcover journal and access to the 12-week video program online, plus free shipping, plus membership in a private Facebook support group with others going through the program, plus a five-day mini course showing you how to let go of stuff that's draining your energy, plus a 30-day 100% money-back guarantee. To start your journey and get all the bonuses, go to BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. That's BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, I'm so excited about today's episode. I often say there's many situations here. Oftentimes with a guest, they wind up giving me something, and oftentimes I give them something or we exchange something mutually. Today, I'm giving you guys, my listeners, something, because if you have not heard Jeff Coleman play guitar, that's right. No, I mean, this guy, I, I, I did not, I have not heard Jeff play until I got connected with him and I started listening to him. Wow. I mean, no bullshit. This guy is one of the most talented guitar players I've ever listened to. All his shit is completely unique, and uh, he's a, a humble, extremely cool guy. And uh, so I want to get into so talk, tell you a little bit of his background. I just want to give a shout out to Anto Drennan. Anto from Ireland, uh, another great guitar player, uh, is one who pointed me in Jeff's direction. So thanks, Anto. So Jeff Coleman, Jeff's pretty much done it all. He's been a side mentor, rock royalty, a session ace, a band leader, and a solo artist. He's best known for his heavy melodic electric guitar playing, fusing elements of jazz harmony and creating his own brand of rock. Let me tell you, throw all that shit aside. Listen to this fucking guy. I don't know any of these words, jazz harmony. <laughs> I mean, if you want to be moved and at the same time, you want to hear someone do something totally unique. I'm going to say a la Jeff Beck. He doesn't sound anything like Jeff, but you know how Jeff's style is so unique? Jeff Beck style, Jeff Coleman style is the same way. It's really cool stuff. He has 18 band and solo releases on his own label, Marmaduke Records, formed in 1987. He's quietly cultivated a worldwide fan base with his ferocious guitar style. So we're going to make it unquietly now. That's what we want. <laughs> Played all over the world. Keep it a secret, man. <laughs> <laughs> At venues like the Kremlin Palace, Wembley Stadium, from Dubai to the Cape Town Jazz Fest. All starting with his original band, Edwin Dare, playing with Sebastian Bach from Skid Row, of course, to gracing the stage of Budokan more than 10 times with Japanese star Ikichi Yazawa. He moved to Phoenix in 95, started getting involved in session work. His career took a decisive turn when he crossed paths with Canadian drummer. How does Shane pronounce his last name? Gala. Gallus. Gallus. Okay. Norwegian Gallus. Okay. Shane Gallus. It's two A's. And two A's, G A A L A. That's a, okay. He's, he's, he's <laughs> it's like a vowel uh, <laughs> vector there. Uh, then uh, with MSG, uh, who is Shane was then with MSG, and that led to the formation of his long running pop. A prog fusion trio called Cosmo Squad, which we'll talk about today because I listened to the latest record. It is mind blowing. And then he moved to LA in 97. He wrote and recorded two albums with UFO singer Phil Mogg, including the Mogg Way album Chocolate Box and Dancing with St. Peter, also covered by UFO. In 2003, he got involved in various capacities with former Deep Purple and Trapeze star, of course, Glenn Hughes in an on and off studio and road band, which was 70s funk rock stuff. The bombastic meat bats consisting of Glenn Hughes, Chad Smith of the Chili Peppers, of course, and Ed Roth, my man, Ed Roth, the keyboardist. Ed was on this show. He is really cool, and he's an amazing player, and he's actually coming here tonight. We're going to hang out in Tampa, funny enough. Um, and that was rounded out by Jeff's former Edwin Dare bandmate, Kevin Chown. Jeff's also recorded with R&B stars Jill Scott and Patti LaBelle, country legends Miranda Lambert and Lyle Lovett, and JoLynn Turner from Rainbow. He shared the stage with Danny Serafine and Bill, Cham Bill Champlin. Bill's going to be on the show like in two weeks. That guy. I was love Bill. Hilarious. I mean, <laughs> way off the charts. Funny. Uh, David Pack of Ambrosia, Steve Walsh from Kansas, Lou Graham from Foreign, of, Co of course, Fee Wable from The Tubes, Bobby Kimball from Toto, Mickey Thomas from Starship, 
Greg Raleigh and Alex Ligertwood and Andy Vargas. Those are all Santana alumni. In 2011, Jeff received an invite from Lord Charles March, who's the 10th Duke of Richmond. All of us, we should know that. To join in with Brian May of Queen as the artist to perform at Goodwood Festival of Speed, a 50,000 acre estate with 130,000 listeners in attendance. He's also toured and is currently getting ready to go out again all over like Turkey, Israel, some really cool place, Moscow with Alan Parsons. He's also, he also has song placements in over 250 major motion pictures, movie trailers, and TV series. I just want to read you some of these. He's got like placements in really cool places. Um, let me make sure I miss it. Okay, Good Morning America, NFL, Animal Planet, which is like one of my favorite channels. American, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't like watch television to be honest. <laughs> But I watch Animal Planet, uh, American Idol, America's Funniest Videos, like The Sands and the Hourglass, These Are the Days of Our Lives, uh, MT only old people know that, MTV <laughs> Cribs, The Simpsons, TMZ, The Super Bowl, Dunkin' Donuts, where would we be without Dunkin' Donuts, right. AT&T, right? Direct you know, those are, those are old credits. We've got better ones these but days. But dude, these are big, these are, bad, these are old credits, but people listening to this are like, <laughs> shit, who wouldn't want to do a commercial for Dunkin' Donuts, right? You know, you're, Jeff, shh, you're supposed to say, thank you. Uh, the A-team, Ice Age 3. That's what people tell me because I'm always like, well, blah, 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 blah. say thank you. I'm like, okay. See No Evil, Failure to Launch, uh, X-Men 3, Resident Evil 3, We Are Marshall, Fantastic Four, Toy Story 3, Friends, Sex in the City, Lion King, Rounders. I'm done, man. What the hell? I got nothing left. Dude, thank you so much. My kids were most excited when uh, I did Zootopia. Zootopia and Zootopia. <laughs> Dude, thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. What uh, an awesome, uh, why, you're like uh, the Roy Buchanan of the, what is it, the greatest unknown guitar. How does it, I've never heard of you. There's like a million credits here for everything, man. Yeah. Um, uh, thank I you. Thank you for coming on the show. Well, it started out with a bad signing of a publishing deal in 1990. <laughs> and it went down from there. Hey, let's talk about your... Your record, you, you formed a record label, Marmaduke, really early on. I was curious what prompted you to do that in hindsight 2020. Was that a good move? Um, yeah, I think so, because I can own and control all my material. And, you know, from a financial standpoint, back in the day, um, you know, when there's the shrapnel record deals with guys like Mike Varney, I just realized I could make more money just selling them on my own. And, uh, and so I went that route. But also, you know, I, I've released records with other artists with guys like Varney and different record labels. So, um, you know, I try to cover all the, all the territories. And with my label, I would do, you know, licensing deals with Europe and Japan. And uh, the guy that helped me get started with that was David Chastain, the uh, Leviathan Records owner, and who's a fantastic guitar player from Cincinnati. What and, you, like business-wise, what prompted you to do that? You were very young when you did that. That was... That was a pretty yeah, ballsy move. Um, yeah, I think I was like, you know, 17, 18 years old. I think the first record actually that we released, I was 14. Um, Holy shit. Not like a solo record, but it was a compilation record. And I, I was playing with a hardcore punk band called The Stain. And Mystic Records had released a bunch of that stuff as compilations. Interesting going back and looking at those because you'll see uh, Black Flag, White Flag, The Mentors, Gigi Allen. And uh, later on, there was one with Offspring going back like 25 years ago. I'm like, how long have these guys been around? That's funny. So, uh, yeah, we've been doing it for a while. That's great. That's really, I took, think that took a lot of balls because, you know, when you're a young kid, especially, you're like, oh, I want to get signed to a label, especially back in 1987, because that's what you did want. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I had a, I had a strange thing that happened, you know, Cherry Lane Music, and uh, they were teamed up with guitar uh, Guitar for the Practicing Musician magazine. Yeah. Basically, guitar player was number one, and guitar for the Practicing was number two. And John Sticks, who had interviewed, you know, Randy Rose, Eddie Van Halen, all those wonderful guitar players over the years, he contacted me. I had sent my uh, schizoid CD to a probably cassette back then <laughs> to funny. these record labels. And then Guitar Recordings, which was the label that Cherry Lane Music owned, they put out like Mark Wood, Blue Ciracino, and uh, uh, what's the bass? Randy Coven. He's still and around. Blue the next guitar player that they were going to release. And so I was on a uh, thing called Burnin where they take two guitar player or two songs from each guitar player. Then they had a contest where the fans picked the best, their favorite guitar player, I should say. 
and then they were going to do a record deal with him. So I ended up uh, being the favorite, and we were, yeah, let's well, great, let's just release Schizoid. And then the label was all set to go. We signed a publishing deal, and I'm thinking it's perfect because they own the magazine, right? That Cherylane Music. I'll be in the magazine every month. Obviously, they're going to promote it because you know they have a vested interest. And then they heard Edwin Dare, and they're like, "We want to put this out." And we were trying to be the next freaking, you know, Iron Maiden, Queens, right? Van Halen. It had so much major label potential. I think it was by the by the time it was all said and done, it was a little too late in the game. But they wanted the shelf. They they're like, "No, we want this band." I'm like, "No, no, no. I, this is not going to go on an instrumental guitar label. This band is, you know." This should be on Warner Brothers. And then, you know, when a manager came in and it got really sticky, he's like, ooh, you signed this agreement. They, you know, it says they own the rights to Edwin Dare too with the publishing. Then I got Ron Beanstalk involved, Billy Joel's attorney. And next thing you know, the whole thing is just a fucking fiasco because it is what it is. And, uh, you know, I moved away from that and then grunge came out and I'm like, you know what? I got to just head West and go <laughs> be a freelance yeah. artist. It was a really difficult thing to do because, you know, you, I love that, that group that we had, but, um, and then, you know, you brush off and get back on the horse. And then I signed a deal with Mark Varney and put a, a record out, my second instrumental record out on Legato, which got a lot of worldwide, you know, success. Is that Mike's, Mike's brother. I didn't I never yeah. know. Okay. So he had another label. Yeah. He had Legato records and he put out, Artists like Sean Lane and um, Brett Garset and uh, you sure. know, Frank Mbali and these kind of guys. T.J. Helmrich. It was a little, I don't want to say classier, you know, because it's not, because Mike Varney's done everything. Yeah. But, uh, it was just a little bit more, you know, not as metal of a label. Mm -hmm. you know, none of those artists I named off are, you know. It's not metal. like yeah. Jason Becker, Marty Friedman. It's a little, little different thing. Sean Lane, you know stylistically sure so. you know it was interesting before i meant to comment when you said this you're the only other guy that i've ever heard besides me when you said we listened to iron maiden with paul diano i love those first two records and i talk to people like oh no 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 you're the only other guy that's yeah. mentioned no, iron maiden was way more original with that lineup i mean yeah i'm a minority because everybody's like you know bruce Dixon, come on paul Diano, yeah. right i get it He's a reliable, he's just, he's great. He's, he's Bruce Dickinson. Right. But those first two records, they had a, such a unique identity. It was like punk, but it was like this, this. It was bluesier. It's part of England that you could, I could see the, I could feel the weather. Yeah. And the vibe when I listened to these records, it was just so raw and unique. Yeah. I it agree was, with you, man. You know? Um, so what, what, when you went out to, what made you pick Phoenix instead of like LA early on? That it was, was just, it's on the way to LA. Oh, so you didn't want to fully commit <laughs> commitment issues? You know what? I had family that lived there and, uh, you know, my aunts and uncles and an uncle picked out an apartment for me. And my concept was I'll stay here for like six months and, you know, fly back and forth to Los Angeles, $88 flight on Southwest and figure out okay. where I want to live and get, you know, get a game plan to go. Okay. And then meanwhile, you had family to anchor to. Yeah. I mean, yeah. nobody really helped me out, but. <laughs> well, I, I, nobody, but as a young kid, you're thinking you need that. Yeah. yeah, and it actually worked out great. And Shane Gallus was one of the first, literally one of the first people I met when I got there. Very cool. One of the greatest drummers alive. And, um, you know, he was rehearsing with MSG for the Written in the Sand album at this place called Phase 4 Studios. And I went to the studio coincidentally with, you know, all the records that I had trying to get session work because it was kind of like an L.A.-sized A studio, but in Phoenix. So I started doing sessions there and that kind of led to a few of those. And, uh, my brother was, you know, had his drum kit in a room, met up with Shane. We all became buddies. And, uh, and then we formed Cosmo squad, you know, the, uh, instrumental thing. And it was interesting when, um, and I'll talk about this later. I have some comments when I was listening to, ooh, when I first got turned on to Cosmo squad, I was blown away by the everybody's playing there. I mean, I literally, I couldn't believe it. So yeah, I was Shane's, you know, all three of you are like really critical components of that thing. And it, it it's, you got something magic there with the three of you, man. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So then you left Phoenix for LA. What, what was the 
kind of the line in the sand that finally pushed you over and, and what'd you do when you got out to LA? Well, you know, Shane's like, bro, you need to be out here. And, uh, I'm like, yeah, that was my game plan. He said, well, let's, you know, we'll, let's rent a house. We'll build a studio. He was at the time living with his aunt who had just passed away in Long Beach. So we ended up renting a four bedroom house and we built a studio. We never even told the landlord. <laughs> nice. the we didn't have any money. You know, we just like, it's amazing how broke you look back and you go, how did we even do it? We got a bunch of old mattresses and crammed them in the attic. And you know, there was already a subdivided wall. And I swear to God, within like six months, I've got like Billy Sheehan over there and Glenn Hughes and Jolyn Turner. And we're making record. Alex Litcher would sing in backgrounds in my house. And it ended up being like a one-stop shop because I could produce, engineer, play guitar. Shane's got his drum tones. He plays drums like nobody. And we ended up doing a lot of records there. In your and makeshift studio. Band, in your They never knew. <laughs> He ended That's up great. selling the house to the next door neighbor. And then, you know, Shane got married, moved out. I eventually moved out and bought a house, uh, you know, not far away. Interesting how it all works. But, That's you know, cool, he man. invited me to, to L.A. We found a place. Right away, I got on tour with Shane with MSG doing the G3 tour with Uli John Roth and Joe Satriani. And two weeks after that tour, I get a call from Mike Varney saying, Phil Mwag is interested in meeting up with you to uh, the reforming UFO. And um, so then I ended up getting that gig. It was interesting how I got the gig because I thought, I'm going to write a couple of songs that, you know, are UFO-esque. And Phil and I sat and listened to him and he's like, yeah, I mean, if you want to do it, let's do it. And so that's kind of how that worked out. That ended up bec becoming Mog Way. Yeah. Because, you know, Phil and Michael had signed an agreement that said they couldn't be UFO without each other at that point. Oh, really? Okay. Phil really didn't want it, but they had had a, you know, a full on fight and Michael, you know, left in Japan and um, there was a lot of, you know, they knew they weren't ever going to get back together. But Phil didn't want to broach the subject with Mike. You know, it's like le legalities, who wants them? So then they ended up calling it Mark Way. And uh, that was a little bit of a heartbreak because I was like, boy, it'd be cool if we could just call Yeah, I just wanted to be called UFO. I got, no. -way, I got Paul Raymond, you know. Uh, Simon Wright was on drums at that time instead of Andy Parker. But uh, it was, you know, three out of five guys, UFO, including the singer. So, um, did, did Vinny um, come in after, after – was he yeah. right after you? Did yeah, so what happened was – we did that record and I knew we couldn't really tour because, you know, um, one of the band members just, he wasn't, he didn't have the ability to go out and play on the road. He's just kind of a, a mess. We don't have to say the name. <laughs> 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 UFO fans go, I know who we're talking about. And uh, so shortly thereafter, um, I called Phil and said, Hey, let's do a film on solo record. You've never done a solo record, you know, and he has this bluesy side to his, and he loves Robert Johnson, all this, you know, like blues. And so we started writing something. He's like, you know what? This feels like a band. I, let's, this is a band. Let's call this something. And we called it Sign of Four, which later became Mog and the Sign of Four for the UFO fans. So they would know it was Phil. Yeah. And we went out and toured that record. And then, you know, I had a, I could tell you my whole life story, but we, I had a run in with the record company a little bit and, pretty much you know fuck you fuck you it fell apart because they didn't want to pay the band members once we got over to england <laughs> well they the just wanted a tour uh, for free well they you know tour the record for free in hindsight i get it you know it's like you know the guys in the band thought they were getting paid as they were going over there and when the label guy told them man eh, you know it's not really going to work that way we're all in it for the long haul i mean it's two sides to a story you know but basically, um, and it was uh, Track Records, Ian Grant from uh, the, the old manager from Big Country. He was mm -hmm. the owner of the label and he was, you know, behind us, but, you know, we kind of had a head on collision and, you know, things like that happen and you, in hindsight, you go, well, maybe I shouldn't have got so pissed off and, <laughs> you know, but it is oh, what man, it is. But you can't, come on, as a young person, you, you know, you can yeah, you almost have countless. Basically, they're not getting paid. When I have it in an email that they're making this much money, you know, these guys, you know, they got rent to pay when they get back to LA and this sort of thing. Back then, you know, no, nobody had a lot of money, you know. Yeah. Um, so what happened after that was 
Phil decided he was going to reform UFO and he reached out to me. What's funny is he says in Classic Rock Magazine, he said, you know, I broached the subject with Jeff, but it just didn't seem like he was that interested. Which is not correct, accurate, it's based well, on what you're saying. You know what? I'm not sure because what happened was when he called me about UFO, I was a little bit taken aback because we had just formed this new band and we had energy in it. And I kind of felt like I was cheating on it. It was like a little weird. So maybe I did give the impression that I yeah. didn't want to do it. But also their manager called me. So we need maybe a more of a, a household name. I was like, okay, whatever. I'm not, I, and I wasn't sure what I thought. Next thing I know, I got a call from Vinnie Moore who I had already worked with on a couple of things. And he's a buddy of mine. He says, you know, they called me about doing this band and he was really like, like it wasn't sure he wanted to do it. And, you know, he's a very cautious kind of guy. He said, you know, what's the downside? What's the upside? I said, you know, Phil can be a little ornery when he drinks and Pete way is a, he's a whole handful of, you know, uh, you know, so I don't know how reliable Pete's going to be. And you're just going to have to make a decision and, you know, decide for yourself. And, you know, he ended up doing it and uh, it's worked out great for him. And, and, you know, and they were able to use the name again. Say it again. They were somehow. So what happened was it sat around and then Michael just, he sent Phil a fax saying, you know what? I'm never going to use the name. I'm never, you know, like I'm not coming back or something, something to that effect. I don't know specifically what he said, but he just, they didn't even have to get into a legal battle. They just gave up the name. Oh, that's great. So. It's funny. I have, um, both Vinny and Billy Sheehan coming on here shortly too. It's, yeah. And it's, it's a, such a small world and it's like all the stories are, they kind of have a little corner of related to this guy and that guy. It's really interesting to hear all this from a third party standpoint. Yeah. You know, we did a tribute to Jason Becker um, and it was on lion records. I can't remember uh, warmth in the wilderness, a tribute to Jason. And what happened was it was all these songs that people had chose to play of Jason's. I was like, man, I can't even play half of these songs. It was so difficult. His technique is so incredible. And so I wrote a song called Jam for Jason. And I invited Vinnie Moore. He came on and played a solo. And um, what made me think of it is you sent me that Jeff Watson email earlier. Jeff Watson. <laughs> he was another guitarist that came on. And he is buddies with Steve Morris. So we brought Steve Morrison and... It's Poland, and you know, I thought it would be great to write a nice long song with all these solo sections that kind of fit the style of these guitar players. You know, Vinny Moore being, you know, a little kind of neoclassical, maybe I'll have like a harmonic minor section for him. When we get to Chris Poland, it's going to get a little more dissonant, like Holsworthy, because he's got that bag in his playing, and Jeff Watson, maybe Les Paul, just you know, uh, kind of a minor progression. and it worked out really cool and all these guitar players came in and, you know, uh, overdub solos and it was a nice tribute to Jason. So, you know, I brought that up because you're mentioning, you know, all these components and different. Yeah. And here we are. We're talking about Vinny and Chris and. It, it, very weird, man. Lots. Yeah. Let me just tell people what happened, but that Jeff, uh, we had problems getting this interview going because Skype wasn't working and then zoom wasn't working. And that's all right. Well, I restarted and I think, Jeff restarted or moved into a different room. And I said, oh, let's try Zoom and I'll send you an email. And then a few minutes later, he sends me a text. He says, hey, um, I didn't get that email yet. And I was like, wow, that's really weird. I sent it right away. And I went and looked and I said, yeah, I'd send it to Jeff Watson, not Jeff Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, oh, I want to change just one, one second. Where did you, were you, did you go to school for music? Just uh, high school. But so how did you become so theory uh, aware? Yeah, I was really um, into, I'd go down to the library, get books, study on my own. It's like I kind of took my own approach to learning theory. And, you know, and I had, you know, when I was a kid, I had a couple of, I had a teacher, a guitar teacher, Randy Sobel, that uh, really forced me to sight read. And we didn't get that deep into it, but it gave me the discipline to just fight through it, you know. And, um, and I studied privately with this cat named Gene Parker, who was Dan Fanley's teacher. It, what, the beautiful thing about Gene Parker was he didn't, he played all the instruments, but guitar. So, you know, vibraphones, sax, flute, piano, 
upright bass. And I learned about the entire history of jazz of the 20th century through this guy, you know, he's like 30 years older, an incredible mentor. You know, he taught Mike Pope, who went on to play bass for Chick Corea. Dan Fanley went on to play guitar for Diana Krall. And he's one of the, you know, leading bebop guitar players of our generation. And so originally I went to Dan Fanley and took a couple of guitar lessons, guitarist to guitarist. And he's trying to show me Pat Martino. He's getting, probably getting frustrated. <laughs> and then he's like, you know who you need to go to? You need to go to the guy that taught me, Gene Parker. So I was a kid that always went privately to, you know, to really learn the craft. And it was great studying with Gene because we talked about improvisation, how John Coltrane would play over changes versus Chet Baker, who is what more oh, space wow. feel than, you know, I remember the first lesson he played me, um, uh, uh, Art Tatum. <laughs> I was like, cause he's like, kid, Art Tatum's from Toledo, brother. Check this dude out. If you think, cause I had, Chops. I went in there like a, you know, a low rent version of Jason Becker. I could play all this whole tone shit and, you know, way more technical than I am now. I didn't have the feel I have now, but you know, when you're like 17 years old and you're trying to take over the world and trying to be on lane, it's like, you know, I was really going for it. And the teacher's like, yeah, check this out. <laughs> you think you know shit. You don't know shit, kid. It was like those kind of lessons. Yeah. And right away I was humbled and, wow, this guy's just kicking my ass. So every week I got ex exponentially better. Jeez. And, you know, I, you know, as a teenager too, I listened to Randy Rhodes and saw his classical side of his playing. So then I went, okay, who can I study with? And I found this elder gentleman, Sam Martinez, who's a wonderful classical guitar player. Then he turned me on to this guy, Ken Hummer. I started doing recitals in Toledo and, you know, working on that. So I was always studying. But I didn't feel like, I don't know, I just, by the time I was 18, 19, and yeah, I was touring with my band around the country. And then when I moved to LA, I kind of already you knew how to, you know, I, I knew theory and I knew jazz theory. I knew bebop. I'm not saying I'm a bebop player because I don't practice it, but I understand the theory of it. Mm. And, you know, I just use these elements to try to, um, you know, it's an amalgamation of different elements in a hard rock setting to create a style, you know, and I always love music, movie music, you know, it's very cinematic. And so I always try to find in the mood and the emotion within it, you know, in the writing. So you so. just, you were like completely self-taught basically. You just, yeah. you were, so you're, you're very disciplined, I'm assuming. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was, <laughs> no, I mean, come on, you no, don't I just, I enjoy life, you know? Yeah. But I mean, you're super disciplined. You don't get to that. You know, you didn't fog a mirror and then one day you knew all this shit. This was hours and yeah, this hours is commitment of pulling out the books and listening and going back and saying, oh, this is how yeah. the note. Now I understand why the, this G sharp is in there as a part yeah. of this. Yeah, that's you know, really I think One of the things I did is when I was 14, you know, I met a friend, this guy, Mark Michael, who's a musical genius, but he's more of a 60s, 70s kind of guy, you know. And he had his own recording studio and, you know, half inch tape. And it was amazing the stuff he was doing. And I, and I went over to his house to record something and he just inspired me to get an eight track reel to reel machine. Me and my brother saved like two grand and we ended up buying a machine. And prior to that, I had a four track cassette machine, but I was recording songs every day. Okay. I would average at least, you know, one or two songs every day. That's great for, you know, two, three years straight, really honing my technique, theory, exploring. It was interesting. And, you, you know, how do you mic an amp? Where do you put the mic on the speaker? How do you use your effects? You know, it's all the process of learning, but you have to do it. You know, so for any young budding guitarist, I would say record yourself as much as you can. Be creative. Listen back. Assess what you're doing wrong. Are you rushing the time? How's your tone? technique because you need an outlet to try to perfect something you know it's like i would spend hours i wouldn't eat i wouldn't shower because i'm trying to get this idea down on tape and make it sound great like you know wow randy Rhodes sounds great how do i get to that or akira takasaki or i'm listening to these guys going how am i going to get to that level and i would just keep playing and playing and pushing through it but it's hard to sit with a metronome and practice and do that it's just not fun 
Right, right. You have to figure out a way to go, fuck, I'm really digging what's happening here. Yeah. And I always got that way with music, with recording and trying to write original music. Your parents are obviously pretty supportive of you. Yeah, my father was fantastic. That's really cool. Really cool. That's the number one, I've said this many times, that is the number one trait of successful guitar players. I'd say with 99 point something percent had extremely supportive parents even if there was dysfunction in the house or whatever the commitment of the parents was really strong for 90 yeah. plus percent of the uh, successful musicians yeah i had a i had an interesting childhood because my parents divorced when i was three and then i lived with an alcoholic mother where we would move around literally every week every month oh wow until i was 12 so from the age, honestly, to, from the age of six to 12 was complete chaos, like gypsy kids. And my father had a second wife. He had his shit together, but he couldn't have us move in with him because it turned out the second wife was manic depressive and we're dealing with meds, the 70s. Holy she ended shit. Up, she ended up committing suicide. The, the, your dad's second wife? Yeah. And then wow, that's some he heavy was able shit. to get custody of us. Once that, okay, once she was out of the way, sort of, and he didn't have to uh, keep yeah, her afloat. A very devastating thing and, you know, just yeah. shocking. I, nobody had ever passed away in my life. And as much as we loved her, you know, she was a very complex um, character. You know, the mood swings were, like, like frightening. So when I moved in with him, it was, he changed our lives. Yeah. He literally said to my brother, you know what, I, if, I'd lo love to, us to move into the rental house that we own. He didn't want to stay in the house that, you know, this situation happened. And my brother, he's like, ah, yeah, but I like it over here. We got a pool. And <laughs> totally oblivious. <laughs> like, he doesn't give a shit that somebody died in the house. He's like, you know. So my dad says, look, Tommy, I'll buy you a drum set. If we, okay, great. <laughs> we moved. Like, the summer of 79. And then it was my birthday, August 10th. He's like, well what do you want to play? I, I'll buy you an instrument, you know? And I saw oh, about guitar. I wanted to play drums, but he's obviously the drummer. And, uh, and that was it. And so having led up to that with such a tough childhood and we all have a tough story, you know, yeah. but it wasn't a white picket fence childhood, you know? And so I never took it for granted because we had it so hard leading up to that. So once I started playing guitar for about a year and a half, saw like, kiss and then randy Rhodes live i'm like this is exactly what i'm doing for the rest of my life i don't give a shit and i've never had a job or done anything else and i figured out a way to raise a family in southern california you know on one income so let me ask you this first of all thank you man because it's interesting uh i had a totally fucked up childhood so i i'm tracking right along with you but I, it's really interesting when i have very few guys open up about that. When I have women, female guests on the show, it's like, I don't even have, it's like within five minutes, they're opening this. It's really interesting. Really yeah, you interesting. Know what? I didn't talk about it until I was like, I remember being on a plane back from England from the, from the sign of four tour with Christopher Maloney. And I had known this guy 10 years and I basically told him that whole story. He's like, wow, I had no idea. And once you tell something once, then you become comfortable with it. Sure. And he yeah. was the kind of guy that could bring it out of you, you know, and I just, and I'd never talked about it at all. I'm like, wow, I never even realized what was going on. You know, you just, cause you're in it. But looking back on it, you, you can turn that into a strength instead of a weakness. You go, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Cause the coping skills you get are tremendous because you're performing in situations, I say performing, functioning in situations that are, way beyond where you should and it forces you to you got to shit or get off the pot man there's yeah. no you can't fuck around here like there's nobody to add, give you help and more importantly musically if you can allow those emotions to get into your music uh it's that's everything and there's so many guitar players that and i don't mean to sing all guitar players but they're so great and musically they're so like i don't feel their emotion in you know, yeah. like if I listen to Guthrie Govin's first record, it's like, wow, it's great technique. But if he's had tragedy in his life, maybe he should. Yeah. 
to feel it, man. I want to feel the emotion. I don't want to just hear notes going up and down the guitar neck. And I don't mean to single him out. I, sure, sure. Well, he's British. They're not really allowed to feel emotion over there. <laughs> <laughs> he's actually, he's a really funny guy. I know. He's, I know. He's, and he's one of the you know, greatest I, guitar players alive. Yeah, totally. But, but um, I, I don't know. I just need to feel the emotion of something. And so I put that first with my music whether it's tension or chaos or eerie or what is this? What is this song supposed to be? I can tell when a guitar player is just using some head to get to a solo to show off. You know, it has to have purpose. So I'm very confident in my songwriting and the fact that I know that what I do, I can get to the emotion more than a lot of guitar players. Because I just, I just don't give a fuck. You know, and I'm just going to let it all out. I can't listen to Frank Gambale's solo records. And the guy doesn't give me any emotion. Yeah. It's there for the purpose of showing off technique. I, yeah. I, I agree with you. I, I, there's a lot of stuff I just, I, and I don't absorb any of that. If I, I listen to music for one reason, to feel something. Yeah. That's Period. why I listen to Randy Rose. That's why I listen to yeah. Gary Moore. That's why oh, I listen Gary to Moore. Vaughan. Yeah. You know, and we, can, and we can talk about those you know, those players. So that's what I aspire to do is when I sit down to write something. And uh, if I don't feel it, it's like, well, what is it? <laughs> it has to, it has to be, number one, it has to have some element of sexiness to it. Like some kind of, um, I don't know, it just has sensuality or if it's heavy, it's gotta be mean. I love Slipknot cause it's just fucking angry <laughs> or Gojira. If I listen to something, if it's just kind of passive, oh, let's see, it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that. Well, what actually does it have? Oh, I can dance to it. Well, that's not quite enough, you know. It has to have some element of an emotion that I can attach, identify with, you know. Let me ask you this. Um, you've done a lot of licensing work, tons. How did that come about initially? And like, how do you, is, is that, is, is the residuals, I don't mean residuals as an income, I mean the, the, the residual work that you continue to get all part and parcel of this whole sum of that, you know, now you've done this, people come to you automatically. You, you know what it is? Um, I have a buddy out here in LA that that's all he does. And he brought me in. Like I'm never the guy picking up the phone and making the deal. Hmm. I'm the guy that shows up at the studio and, and co-writes the song and I'll sing, play guitar, play bass. He mixes it, sends it off, sells it. Okay. It's in the mail. And what happened, what's nice about it is that you'll get paid over and over. Oh, You're it's great. Building, you know, an equity in this thing. So, you know, I can kind of pick and choose what gigs I want to go out and do. Meaning I have friends that all they do is tour to make money. And so they're constantly in that uh, survival mode and they'll pick any gig, some of them, because they have to get paid to pay their rent or their mortgage or, you know, their family's medical. You know, when I had children, I decided, okay, I'm going to have a couple of years where I'm with, I want to see my kids when they're infants. And I don't want to go out, you know, tour for 11 months and not be there for my children. And, you know, I've, I've talked to people about this and read articles with guys like Steve Vai, where they literally weren't around as much as they wanted to be for the kids when they were young. And you can't get that back. And it's a decision. So I consciously made a decision. And, you know, my, my children were born 2005, 2008. I was very selective with my touring. And I made sure leading up to that, that I started getting into this residual income with film and TV, having the record company or having, you know, built in record sales with my guitar fan base so checks would just come in the mail and i did not have to go out and tour to make a living that's so I cool man. Happy for you. Oh, i gotta believe because of your nutty childhood that meant so much more you know that you wanted to give them what you didn't have right yeah i know exactly how that feels man it's like yeah and it's a very re rewarding and, and you'll see it even more as time goes on, as your kids get older. Not that you feel, um, it's a very uh, content, there's a lot of contentment that you have when you see that, you know, you had no teachers for this, yet somehow you were able to put some little magic together in your household for them. It's a really good feeling. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Really good feeling, man. Now we're all somber. <laughs> what's that? No, I'm, hey, man, it's just fucking life, you know? you know. All right, hold on a minute. Uh, what gauge is your uh, guitar string? Um, uh, <laughs> what's yeah. your fucking matter? No. <laughs> man, you had something else go on that was pretty deep. Um, if you want to talk about that with your brother. Yeah, you know, that was, uh, it was, I remember the day I was coming back from the YMCA with my children and, and there was, I left my garage door open and police officers knocked on the interior door, which leads to the kitchen. And they said, you know, they pulled out his driver's license, said his social security number and said he's deceased. And I about, you know, fell over in the driveway. I think I might've passed out. Um, he, you know, my brother was the drummer in my group. He's my only sibling. And he was the Alex Van Halen in my life. It was the same arrangement. Alex a little older than Eddie. Kids trying to take over the world. You know, we had the band. We put out maybe four or five records. We moved to Phoenix together. And then it's almost like he handed me off to Shane Gallus. as okay, this is going to be your drummer from now on. You know, Shane is just at another level. My brother Tommy was kind of like Tommy Aldridge with uh, a couple Dave Weckl Latin drum videos. Like he could do, he had that scope in his <laughs> It was like if Tommy Aldridge could play a few cool Latin beats, not that he can't. That was my brother. Yeah. Shane is like the ninja drummer of, you know, he's like yeah. everything that you could ever want. And from Vinnie Colliuti to Bonham to, you know, Gene Hogan. So, and, and my brother, you know, I saw Shane struggling back then, like, fuck, man. And this guy knows everybody and he's 10 times the drummer I am. And so my brother made a conscious decision. I'm going to move to Florida. And uh, cause half of our band, Edwin Dare moved there. Mm. And so he lived down there and he had record deals and he did a lot of great stuff over the years. But once my father passed away, I think that was a, a, something that changed in my brother where he didn't have that family element, you know, and he, I'm out in California. I've got kids now. He's kind of down there by himself. And I think he was, uh, you know, lost his way a little bit. And, you know, there's, there's many, um, the story is, you know, we don't know what happened. Basically, he was pulled over by a police officer and the police officer shot him four times. Actually shot at him 15 times, hitting him four times. 15, he shot at him 15 times? Yeah. Was he armed? He said he had a AK-47 in his truck. And he, they, the officer said that the window rolled down and he could actually see the barrel. And at that point, he had to start shooting. But the officer uh, had done two tours of duty in Iraq, post-traumatic stress. Why didn't he just call for backup? Why did he have to corner him? Did he really have a rifle in the car? We don't know. But, you know, all you can look at is the facts of um, he had never been arrested before up until two weeks prior to that. And that was a bogus arrest, loitering. They let him out the next morning. It was the same officer that pulled him over that arrested him. And then I got down to Florida and this is where, you know, I can't really talk about much more because sure. it's for the safety of, you know, my family, who yeah. knows? Yeah. It's like you're in a movie like training day, trying to figure it out. You know, Wow. I could probably tell you enough right now that <laughs> it could get me in trouble. So we just leave it at that. It is what it is. There's no witnesses. And, uh, you know, that's the most difficult thing our families ever went through. And oh ever I'm so sorry. When was this? 2012. Wow, man. I'm really sorry. Yeah. Holy shit. And it's amazing how, uh, you know, this information travels. I, I remember being at the NAMM show and Virgil Donati came up to me and I'm thinking, you know, I did one gig with him, but I, I barely know the guy. And he knew the, he knew the story, like just random. It really resonated through the community. Michael Landau sent me an email out of the blue who I didn't know that well then. He said, you know, I'm thinking about you. You know, we're all nice. about you. And, so it's, you know, but again, it, something like that happens, you can self-destruct. I, what I did is I picked up an acoustic guitar and I went into my room for six months and just, you know, recorded a record. It was a Granada, you know, just emoting and trying to cope with using music and, you know, instead of going out and, you know, self-destructing. So. so let me ask you this, because I get asked this question sometimes. You have persevered through stuff that um, 
what's a better way to say it? Uh, sometimes bad things happen to good people, right? What do you attribute that to and to not going south as a person on things, to, you know, to still like, you know, get up, do what you do, put a smile across your face yeah. and make the best out of life? Well, it's interesting. A few months back, I went to, uh, I go to SRF, uh, which is uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, non-denominational church. And this guru is probably one of the reasons why Jason Becker is still alive. That's like his guru. It was also, you know, um, um, George Harrison was really into this church. And fortunately, we have it out here in Southern California. And Tony Franklin is a big supporter in this church. And I've, I had went through all the, you know, Catholic and Christian religions and then atheist gave up. And then you find something and go, well, this makes sense to me. Um, and what's interesting is that the guru there talked about, you know, there's a time in everybody's life that you're just going to, you're not going to see it coming. You're going to get knocked off your feet where the foundation of your entire life is just going to leave you flat on the ground. Is if you understand that that's going to happen and accept it in advance and prepare for it emotionally, mentally, that you're going to get knocked down, but you've got to get back up and you have to figure out a way to deal with this. You know, you have children, maybe one of your children's going to die and that's going to be the thing. You don't know, but it happens to everybody. Yes. I can tell that, you know, with all the people that I know, it's just, I went through this stuff sooner than a lot of them. My parents died really young. My mother died two years older than I am right now, but we're all going to, but now my friends are starting to have these things, you know, 10 years later than I did. You know, my mother lived hard and she never apologized and she knew she wasn't going to live to see 60 years old, you know, right. or 55 years old. So the guru kind of summarized it. And I think I already had that in me that, you know, I have to survive. I have to carry on. I'm the only one. Right. There was only, there was only two Coleman's and I'm the only son of my father out of three boys. You know, my father had two brothers. Nobody had kids. I'm the only one in the family that had kids. Oh, wow. Never had children. So I, you know, I have to be strong for everybody. Sure. So, you know, it's a choice. It is a choice, man. You know, and my wife has always been there for me. And you know, if I didn't have her, I would have self-destructed. After my mom died, you know, sure. I lasted until about two thousand three. And you know what? I probably already was. I remember looking back, you know, being pretty wild, you know, driving fast on Jägermeister, coming over the Hollywood Hills with my friends, and they were ready to self-destruct with me because. They love me, you know, and we're brothers in arms. But you get through it, then you go, wow, man, <laughs> we're lucky we made it through. Yeah, sure. I laugh about it, but, you know, some aren't so lucky. Sure. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. And um, thank you. Yeah. Let's segue and switch. I want to talk about um, Cosmo Squad. You know, uh, I'm going to multitask right now and get a – a power adapter. A power adapter. Computer, I'm going to talk about. It's on eight <laughs> percent. Let me talk about Cosmo Squad while you're grabbing that. So, right. Cosmo Squad is Jeff's fusion trio with himself, uh, Shane Gallus, and um, who's your bass player? I'm sorry, Kevin Chown. Who Kevin was Kevin Chown? The, right, C H O N. Edwin Dare bass player, who's also the bass player for the Bombastic Meat Bats with Chad Smith. Right. So it's it's Kevin Chown on bass, Chef Shane Gallus on drums, and Shane keeps time like a freaking Swiss watch. That was my comments here. Yeah. Um, the their last record was called Morbid Tango, and all right, I want to talk about some of the tracks in there, and I want to encourage everybody to um, check it out. So I want this. There's just a few tracks I I want to go over. I really, first of all, when you put this record on, it's not. Nothing like I've ever heard it. I mean, ever heard. It's just completely different from a music standpoint. The writing is really good. And the assault of sound, and I mean that in only the best way, is just really amazing. Uh, let's talk about this song called Always Remember the Love. You're like a very tender um, writer at times. Your, your songs are very tender, even though the music is... Um, 
extremely powerful. The, the, the songs are very tender, which is what I really like. So you have always remember the love. Beautiful, beautiful ballad. It's got a great crescendo, great climax. In the entire song, really, my hairs on my arm were standing up. Who is that for, and what's the backstory to that? You know, uh, well, we talked about my mother passing away, but Shane's mother passed away pretty close to the time we started making that record, as well as Kevin Chown's mother passed away. And so as we were, and I think we only spent, you know, like a month working on this record. We get together every, you know, a couple days a week and maybe six weeks tops. And, you know, it was a lot of good therapy because Kevin's had a tough run. He had brain surgery. He had a half inch of his brain taken out in six years ago. Wow. And his mother passed away. And, you know, and they started talking about family and dysfunction. And, you know, the thing is, is that, all three of us were very close with both parents and as fucked up as things got, I mean, you know, none of us were physically abused. It was all, it was all love and it all ended well. And, you know, uh, there's no regrets with any of us with our parents. But the thing is when we get, we'd get together to play music, you know, we're truly brothers where we talk about all this stuff. We're not just guys going, Hey, we're spending more energy talking about life and family than like, you know, what this band's doing or what sound is, you know, what should we be doing? We don't, we don't care about any of that. We just, we're just going to play and we're going to emote, but we'd spend as much time talking, especially Kevin and Shane who always knew each other, but really bonded over this record. Cause this was the first record that Kevin joined Cosmo squad. We had other bass players prior to him and I've known Kevin for 25 years. Um, and him and Shane have known each other, but really, you know, coming up together every day and talking and bonding. And uh, so it was very special. And they got on the subject of mothers. So when we wrote the ballad, you know, it's like always remember the love of your mother and, you know, how it got you through. Very cool. I, you know, I don't even remember coming with an idea. We just started playing. That, that song just wrote itself. Very cool. Yeah. You know, another song on there. Uh, called the crosses and all the songs most of the songs are meaty you know five plus some of them six plus minutes uh i thought it was something you might hear like on a jeff beck record again without sounding anything like beck and i i like the song it was i like darker stuff that is like i i, I like darker stuff that's ends with an optimism mm-hmm you know, like hope for the future. I think that's one of the best emotions that anybody could evoke is hope because that's what we're all looking for. You know, that fucking tomorrow is going to be better, man, you know? Right. And uh, so I thought that was very cathartic. It was angst-ridden, but like by the end, I said, man, you're free, you know? Yeah. And uh, what a groove you had going on in there. So tell me about the, the, the backstory yeah, of that it, song. It's interesting. That, that song, um, you know, some of them start with all of us just coming together in the studios. Uh, maybe half of them start with me bringing in an idea. That particular one, Kevin Chown brought in a loop and the, the basis for the, you know, the, uh, the A section of the tune, which was, which was great. I'm like, oh, great. The bass player is coming in with something cool. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of just showing up and playing one and five. So he uh, <laughs> kind of set the mood for that one, you know, and then as it gets in these other sections, it was, a, it was a, group collaborate you know collaboration um but yeah it's got this kind of eerie pulsing thing going on and i love that there's that like a half step slip with the minor chord where it's a half step lower and then to the you know tonic and then a half step higher than down and you know with the uh the digital effects going on and stuff with the loops and it's, it's really got a cool vibe and shane's his pocket on the drums and the and the, the drum fills are just so you know oh that that dude is uh, he's yeah he's untaught i mean he's a phenomenal drummer yeah it's like bonham 3.0 with oh, the <laughs> you know what's interesting what's so bobby jarzombeck the drummer for halford and fate's warning and he and i were hanging out with somebody else who said i don't know who shane is and bobby goes I said, Bobby, tell him, tell him about Shane. And Bobby's one of the greatest heavy metal drummers alive who can also play Western swing, which is amazing. That's <laughs> weird. <laughs> heavy metal. He goes, he goes, he goes, fuck that guy. He goes, he's so good. He goes, 
forget the drums. He goes, I remember seeing a video of Shane in Japan playing guitar and singing, fronting the band and fucking singing in Japanese and killing it. He goes, that guy's Oh too- my <laughs> God. Case closed, man. And singing yeah. in Japanese. Yeah. Wow. Great, great, great track. So, so is our most, do you, primarily do the writing or like is it on occasion the other guys or you know what in in a lot of the groups it's i come up with like 60 percent of it and then you know and then there are collaborations on the rest definitely Uh, at 50 plus (laughs) (laughs) i always say with the meat bats i'm the only guy that comes up with an idea in advance actually the last time we got together Ed, Ed just... I was going to say, Ed's got to... That guy's Ed got to... Yeah. on the fly. Yeah, he's... You know, it's an organizational skill where some guys won't take the time to organize an idea in advance. But those guys, all three of them, you know, Chad... Chad just starts laying down a groove and uh, it's just, you know, happening. Um, but yeah, Ed, he just writes on the fly, you know. Yeah. He's a lot a of times I'll come in with musician. a... I'll come in with a, an A section and he'll come in with a cool bridge or he'll have some chords... Then I'll come up with a melody or, you know, it's, it, I would say it's a great collaborative band as well. Completely different kind of approach. To Cosmo Squad. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. I have a dog stuck in a studio. <laughs> oh my God. Do you like think? almost 16. So. Oh man, you got to get her out. Yeah. Yeah. We have talk and I'll be right two, do- two dogs. <laughs> Go ahead, do your thing. <laughs> 10808. Here we go. We got it. You got it. There you go. Oh my God. That's like the dog that show, man. Uh, uh, with Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. What was that dog? Yeah. Yeah. Pug. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't remember the name of the movie, but. Uh, Okay, then you have something really cool. The last two tracks is Beyond Death Door and Beyond Death Door Reprise. Beautiful tune, man. You got the acoustic on and then you got the electric. What was that about? Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, let's see. You know, conceptually, um, it's like morbid tango. There's, there's a lot of these tracks where... Um, like Morbid Tango, for instance, you know, it talks about you, you're doing this dance to life, you know, is, is uh, ridiculous as things can get, is bizarre, where all you can do is laugh because, you know, you're just dealing with so much chaos. It's like you're doing the dance of life to get through it. And, you know, the, the crosses, and then you have uh, Beyond Death's Door. It's like, you know, again, getting through these situations that are just, you know, uh, very life challenging. And, uh, you know, that song, it's like, I remember when we went to write it, now I'm thinking about it, Shane says, and it has nothing to do with the song, but he says, man, let's write something slow. And he goes, you ever hear, um, um, what's the uh, Black Sabbath song? I was just gonna say, there's an old Sabbath song that this reminded me of. I'm having, I'm having a brain dead moment. It's like Nib or Behind the Sign Wall. Of the Southern Sleep. Cross. Okay, yeah, with Dio. Great song. Yeah, yeah. Boom. Yeah. Doom, doom. Now, our groove isn't even 4-4, four, four, and the chords are completely different. Mm-hmm. But Kevin goes, I don't know if I know that one. So we cranked it in the studio, and Vinny, Vinny Apice, his groove is just stupid and just the vibe, right? Great song. And what so sometimes, you know, you'll just go, man, let's just do something that's ah, slow and dirgy space. And, and, you know, I started coming up with the major seven to the minor six, nine chord changes with a low baritone guitar. And it's like beautiful and ethereal, but at the same time, you know, kind of haunting and, you know, Again, it's like you're trying to, I I always think of movie music, you know, back in the seventies and eighties, I'd go to these movies and go see Scarface and you're just so moved by the music or Jaws or, you know, the music of John Williams. And so when I write, and I'm not comparing myself to these people, it's just an inspiration to try to draw from. Yeah. Instead of just three chords. And (laughs) I like that too. I can put on an early ACDC and, you know, all day long and just love 
G, F, and you know D chords. Sure. But with my music, I like you know a little more color, and try to find something unique within the changes. And oh, okay, that's interesting. Now we're creating a vibe here. You know. Well, man, it's a it's a beautiful amazingly cool record man i really appreciate you making it. i'm really glad i got turned on to it i want everybody just to tell you the name of it. The, the first of all the band is cosmo squad it's uh jeff coleman's trio it's really amazing it's called and the, the album the last album is called morbid tango and i've downloaded like all the other albums from uh apple music here because i want to yeah. go through all the rest what just just great stuff and and uh, so please check it out cosmo squad morbid tango um you know, I'll mention that you mentioned Jeff Beck twice. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's what the thing is. He's one of the greatest interpreters of melodies alive. Yeah, he really is. But most people don't know he's really not a writer. Even like Beck's Bolero was written by Eric Clapton. Most of his songs on most of his records are written by other people, whether it be Tony Hymas or Jan Hammer. Mm. Even his newer stuff. You look at the collection. If you go to all music, you can see the credits. Yeah. I had an argument with Danny Zaleski, the uh, Alan Parsons promoter. He said he's one of the greatest artists. I said, well, yeah, he's a great guitar player, but I'm really into songwriters. Yeah. And so as much as, you know, we all love Jeff Beck, I'm going to, I'm just going to put more stock in a guy like David Gilmore because he writes the song. Yeah. Gilmore's Beck's my own hands down he's, favorite guitar player. He's, he's an interpreter of, of melodies and he does it like nobody else. Well, even he does like a lot of really cool, like uh, Irish folk songs and he'll interpret them stuff like, you know, with yeah. names you can't pronounce unless you speak Gaelic. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, that's interesting. That's and Carlos Santana is another guy that he's, he, you know, a lot of his big hits are not written by him. Sure. None of them were, you know. Gu guitar wise, you're always, it sounds like, like almost all the time you got a strat in your hands. Uh, it's every variation. I have a, use a telly a lot with a drop C tuning. Uh, I'm using a Yamaha baritone a little bit on the record. I strats, tellies, Les Paul, 335, flying V, you know, um, what's, your, you, what's your favorite guitar to play that you have? Like your yeah, go-to. It's, it's a, it's a 56 reissue strat. And I've got an early 63 that I've had in and out in my life. And, um, it sounds like a woman. I've had a 63 year early and out of my life. I actually sold it to an investor. He paid me a fortune for it. And because you know what? I, I loved it, but you know, um, sometimes money is good too. Yeah. Yeah, of course. But I'm not going to regret it. You know, I talked to Steve Lukather about this. He's like, yeah, I've sold a few of my Les Pauls and I made a fucking fortune of it, you know, and put my kids through private school and, you know, and you know, maybe you have regrets, but maybe not, you know, he's, he mentioned you on his interview. Him. He mentioned you, he, Luke, oh. Luke mentioned you on his interview and he said, you're one of the greatest modern players that he said he's only, he said he's only recently known you. Yeah. I think we became friends like three, four years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, yeah, he said, you're, he said you're, you're in a, you were the guy he mentioned. Well, that's wonderful. And you look at, I mean, he's such a great writer. Yeah. And as Dan Tracy says from Alan Parsons band, Dan Tracy, by the way, is I think <laughs> Steve Lucas is biggest fan. He says, you know what? He's not only the greatest guitar player, like he says he's the, one of the greatest musicians alive. He thinks of him more as a musician, big picture, you know, songwriter, singer, lyricist, you know, piano, guitar. He sees a big picture. And uh, it's interesting. He's so much more than just a guitar player. Yeah, for sure. Man. And talk about a humble guy. I mean, you know. Very nice guy, too. Yeah, he's funnier than shit. <laughs> he is funny. So, okay, your 56 reissue strat would be number one. What would be two and three that you pick up? Uh, you know what? I just recently got a Hamer Vector Karina V that just is blowing my face off. I love it so much. And, uh, it's the an neck older pickup, guitar, right? Yeah, the neck pickup uh, through a, my Fender Pro amp just sounds like Robin Ford Tiger Walk, man. <laughs> it's, ridiculous. it's so good. But you know what? Right now I have a, you know, I always keep my collection at right around 45 guitars. And there's definitely a top 10, you know, there's a, uh, a few of the guitars I've gotten from Wildwood Guitars in Colorado. Yeah. Picked. They're my favorites. Okay. So let me ask you, what about them? You know what it is, is that they, 
they have such quality control. They, they get a limited edition runs because they kick ass. They're the biggest selling, you know, uh, company out there. Meaning like, you know, Manny's or this kind they do like more than all the guitar centers put together with yeah. custom shop instruments. So they'll get the rights to an exclusive run for Gibson, like the Gibson featherweight wildwood guitar. Now, what is that? What it is, is they'll choose the lightest East coast maple wood. There's no, um, weight relieving, no holes in the guitar to make it lighter, but it's under eight pounds. So it just without has- being chambered. Yes. I got one for Chad Smith and I have one. Uh, Greg Koch turned me on to him. And, you know, mine weighs like 7.98 pounds. Beautiful flame, sings like a bird. You know, the, the hide glue, everything is so much closer to the 59, the original year. And Wildwood has the ability to call Fender or Gibson or Fender for that matter and say, look, this is what we want to do. We want to do a limited edition run. And they've got power because they kick ass and they sell, you know, $7 million in custom shop guitars a year out of a little store in Wildwood, Colorado. And the cool thing about them is I can go there, go into the warehouse and back and literally play 50 Les Pauls that are iced tea color. Let's say that's my trip. I'm looking for yeah, yeah. 59. They have so much in stock. Where can you go to do that? You know? And you know, it's amazing. What I never realize is you go to their website they have incremental measurement differences between each guitar yeah and that obviously they make a difference when you pick it up yeah you know the owner steve Mesplay has talked me out of guitars because he goes i'll email him and go oh i really like number 49 he'll go you know what yeah it looks great but that guitar i played it after you emailed me you know he emailed me back an hour later and go that's not the one that's going to inspire you. I don't think you should go for that one. That's very cool. Let me, let me keep looking. And I'll say, you know, I, I'm really looking for this particular tone. And I'll explain to him in the 70s and a couple of records that I really liked and this guitar tone. You know, I don't want the dark, murky Les Paul sound. I don't want the John Sykes thing. I want, you know, uh, and I'll give him a specific kind of thing. Like, you know, whether it be the guitar Barracuda by Heart or, you know, uh, carry on my wayward son or some kind of, you know, a little more bright and a kind of thing. And, and he'll understand what I'm talking about. And, you know, it took him like six weeks. Then he goes, I think I found you the guitar. Now I'll send it to you. And if you don't like it, just send it back. Sure. Sure. You know, but we have that kind of relationship. I used to do some videos for them in a couple of clinics and, and uh, they're just wonderful people. So um, in my top 10, I would say four of my guitars are Wildwood. I have a, a 60s Tele. I have a Seafoam Green Strat that John Cruz has done and set up for me. Dude, that is such a beautiful guitar. I've seen that on some videos yeah. of yours. Wow. That yeah, that's my go-to guitar nice brand. Guitar. It has a Brazilian rosewood fretboard and, you know, so. Very cool. Um, you know, I interviewed Greg ages ago and I forgot what it is, but, uh, he'll go out there and shoot like 40 of those videos a day. Yeah. Some absurd. And, and it's all on the fly. Yeah. Every one of, there's no, nothing scripted plan. No, yeah. I did the same thing uh, with Wildwood maybe like four or five years ago when they started. Um, but he's definitely better at it. <laughs> Basically what they want it to be is like just you casually picking up a guitar and right. then, talking about what you're feeling as you're playing it. Go through the pickup selection and give the serial number and play. And then the people can click on it and hear it and listen and go, Ooh, I like that. And then Greg really started taking off with it because he's just so charismatic and funny. And right. the guy can play any style of, you know, guitar. And, you know. Incredible play. I, I email him every year going, okay, settle down, stop practicing. You're getting too fucking good. <laughs> he's, he's, you're losing us, buddy. He's the number one person that everybody I've interviewed says, you know, he's the most disciplined practice guy around. Consistent. Yeah, he has like four or five children. It's amazing. He's got guys. five kids. Yeah, there you go. And he's all about family. And I said, what is it? Uh, and I'll ask you this question too, cause since it came up. Um, I asked him, I said, what, tell me something about yourself that, pe- that surprises people the most. He goes, well, the number one thing is I don't party. I don't drink. And right. every time I'm, Huh? <laughs> he used to yeah well right but you know he's he, because he's so charismatic and like off the wall and humor people always come over dude let's go have a beer and he's like i don't you know 
I'm about, I got to go to work and I got to go see my family, period. You know, yeah. that's his, you know, yeah. that's his thing. There's not enough hours in a day to do it all. No, man, there's not. Um, favorite players you've enjoyed jamming with? Uh, man, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I've enjoyed jamming with Greg, to be honest with you. We've done a couple of Defender events, played together. Uh, my buddy Jeff Marshall, who I love, and we play together a lot. Um, we've had Steve Lukather play with the Bombastic Meat Bats, uh, which is fun. And, you know, he's one of my heroes. So I put that up there, though. I'd, you know, like to uh, jam and record with him again, do some kind of thing. Um, interesting question. Are you speaking of guitar players and musicians? Per Primarily guitar players, but go with your knee-jerk reaction. That's what I, I would like. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Interesting. Let me think about this. You know, I had a jam with Ray Luzier uh, a couple of years ago, and I really love that. We put a couple of things together, and and he's just and him and Shane are good friends, and they're they're similar kind of drummers that play with the same ferocious, you know. Dude, Ray is fashion. not yeah. human. I mean, yeah. And I had him on the show too. He's as equally class of a guy as he is a quality of a drummer, you know. Yeah. But I saw them in a small club here with Jonathan Davis's band, and um, I've never seen anybody do that in my life. Yeah, you know, to sit yeah. twenty feet away from the dude, I was like, it's like, I, like, where's your third leg here, man? What, right. How are you doing this? Yeah, I like Jam with Jude Gold. He's a great, you know, from uh, Guitar Pro Magazine. Yeah, we've done a podcast, and I've gotten him. Uh, out at the baked potato playing with us. And yeah, he's, he's fun. One of my favorite guitar players is Michael Landau. I long to have a, a jam with them and record something with him at some point. He just, he's, he transcends the instrument. And, you know, when, when I was talking about guys that maybe don't show so much emotion as they play, he's just the opposite. He's just, <laughs> just amazing. You know, he can really paint a scenery in front of your eyes. You know, at a place like the baked potato, you just like, oh my God, this guy's just like killing it. And if you don't get it, then you don't get it. So uh, I, I spoke with him about coming on the show. He's very nice. He said, look, I just don't do anything like this ever. He goes, but thank yeah. you for, you know, he's very, you not know, really gracious about it, but he's just not my thing. He's a nice guy, but yeah, he's, he's just, he's very, uh, he's, uh, he's an artist. Yeah. You know, he's. He's, uh, yeah, he's got his own thing and you can't kind of, he's not going to go out there and promote himself. And he called me once about, cause I'm in with Fender. Obviously he's in with Fender too, but he, he needed something. And, uh, I had a Fender connection and I guess he didn't want to contact his connections, but basically he just needed a, a Fender DeVille that was, you know, European voltage. I'm like, Mike, you know, they think you're Jimi Hendrix over there. <laughs> <laughs> You, you just pull some of the strings that are above your head and they'll do whatever you need. But I think he's the opposite of like a Joel Holkstra. He's not going to promote himself. He's not going to, you know, he's not even probably going to, you know, he's, I think he still buys his guitar strings from musician's friend instead of getting them free. You know, it's just the way he is. So he's a, he's a true artist and he's uh, he's doing it. And, you know, I think just, just as a engineer alone, He's incredible. Like his records sound incredible, you know, better than most anything I've ever heard. And this is know, Bill Frizzell. You know what? I haven't really listened to him. I, I know the name for years. Uh, I, I got to put him on and listen to him. Yeah, he's an interesting cat. Really very different. Very different. Yeah. But Mike's, he's just not a self promoter. He's not comfortable with that whole thing. And, you know, He'd rather just be doing it than talk about it. Yeah, totally. But, you know, if he did an interview with you, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what everybody says. Well, that's what happens because I get phone calls, right, all the time. Like, hey, Craig, I need to find out more about my buddy X. I'm giving him your name. <laughs> I want you to get him on this because <laughs> the same thing you said. They want to listen to this stuff. Yeah. Do you know Doug Bossy? Yeah. So Doug and George Bernhard, you know, played, they've been buddies for 30 years. They were both in the mustard seeds together. And uh, I had George on this show, unbeknownst to Doug. And he goes, holy shit. He goes, 
I've known George 30 years. I didn't know half that shit about, about <laughs> <laughs> So now everybody's like, okay, get this guy, um, which is very flattering and nice and all that stuff. But, yeah. Um, he and I have been talking about getting together. and Bossy? Yeah. He's great. Yeah. He's a phenomenal writer and guitarist. Yeah, he's, he's and great. he's also a very sweet guy. Yeah. He's a quality guy, man. Yeah. Really good dude. Um, Desert Island Discs for you. Knee jerk reaction. No particular order. Any of the first Van Halen records. Uh, ours, Distorted Lullabies. Here's a surprising one. The Cure Disintegration. Great record. <laughs> yeah. But I don't like The Cure otherwise. I just want to turn them off, but I love that record. <laughs> uh, Radio Head OK Computer. Great, great album. Um, Michael Andow Live. Either the 2000 record or 2006 record. Also, his uh, organic instrumentals record. Uh, man, there's some John Coltrane stuff. Uh, Miles Davis kind of blue. So John awesome. Schofield, Blue Matter. Dude, you're over your limit, man. Yeah, it could be, uh, I don't know, fucking Kiss Double Platinum. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so yeah. let me ask you that same question I asked that I had asked um, Greg something about yourself. People would be surprised to hear or find a little odd. Uh, I drink alcohol five days a week, at least. <laughs> really? I, I'll, I'll tell you what. <laughs> and the first thing, the first thing I said to Jeff was, God, you look so young. How the hell are you doing it? And that was his response because I drink alcohol five days a week. So, you know, <laughs> I'm my mother's child. <laughs> what? I, what? Chief, what are you? you know, I, I appreciate a good pale ale or IPA. And that's uh, it. That's it. Okay. I'm more passionate about Three Floyd's beer than most records that are coming out right now. <laughs> I noticed that T-shirt. I was looking at that. Your your, yeah. your sweatshirt yeah. it said Three Floyds. I was wondering what that was. Is that? It's it's an IPA. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're, well, no. They they're, it's a it's a brewery that makes um, the whole gamut of beers, but they're in Munster, Indiana. And, uh, you know, a couple blocks away from my sister-in-law. Last time I was there, I, the next door neighbor lent me the, their Tesla S model to go there and drink. I'm like, oh, what could go wrong with this? Yeah. Well, my favorite brewery and my, you know, favorite new car. But, you know, they're like a, they're like a cult band that, you know, it's kind of like when Iron Maiden came out and nobody knew who they were, Paul Diano, and you just wanted to, like, wear the T-shirt or the wristband. And it was like the secret club that most kids didn't know about. That's what Three Floyds is. You go there, and not only is it a great brewery that can sell out next week for a billion dollars, but they don't want to. They also spin vinyl in there, and there's all this heavy, great music that I've never heard of that they're into, and you know, and they don't exploit bands, but they have bands that endorse them like Mastodon, and they're just a cool underground vibe. And their beer is just like you know tremendous. Mastodon, I hear their name a lot. They must be they're getting pretty big because i hear them yeah they have they've now. been big for a while um and i'll say my favorite thing about joe bonamassa is that i met his sound man at the arcada theater and he and he turned me on where i could buy three floyds three blocks away <laughs> 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 yeah. the, what jeff best decision you ever made what do you think of all the decisions you made is the best uh making a career in music and never faltering I give you a lot of credit for what you said, man. You said I've been able to support on one income a family in LA. That is big shit. I, I, so. tell, I tell my wife, hey, even Steve Live's wife has a job. <laughs> she wants to. I said, honey, you can go back to work if you want. My wife's well, retired. You know, we're we're like traditional. She she went to Purdue and IU and you know, psych nurse, and she worked until we had children. And we decided, you know what, let's do the traditional thing like our grandparents, where uh, stay home you know, with the kids. Stay home and take care of the kids. And, and I take care of the kids too. I took them to school and I'll pick them up from school. But, you know, then I'm out of town for five weeks on this tour. So, yeah. It's, you know, it's a balance. But I'm proud to say that, you know, um, I've done it on one income. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I haven't had family members die and leave me a bunch of money. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got a late sixties Cadillac from my dad that we sold and split the split five grand or something. But yeah, I'm proud to, to be out there doing it. You know, and sometimes, sometimes in my life more than 10 times, it's been like, Holy shit. You know, you're taking change to the vending machine to pay your, you know, 
$3,500 mortgage and then some. But, you know, I've had a good run and, and um, the film and TV stuff had saved me in times where people were foreclosing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So if I didn't have that, you know, I, I might not still be in this wonderful house, you know. Tough question. You, know, you, just, have to, you just have to persevere. Tough, I'm tough. multitasking, sorry. I'm no, it's all good, man. You, are you getting an IPA or what? <laughs> it's too early right now, but I had a guy. The other night. I had a guy one time. And he, he, it was like eight a.m. in L.A. and he goes, "Hey, do you mind if I smoke a joint?" And I'm like, "Dude, I can't manage my own life. Don't ask me to manage yours. You know, I mean, do <laughs> <laughs> whatever you want to do, man. You know, right? Um, tough question. What do you like most about yourself? Uh, the fact that I, you know, I enjoy life i surround myself with good energy good people and uh i don't take it too seriously i i think i have a good balance of enjoying friends not getting caught up in the ego and um you know allowing yourself to have a good time you have to enjoy life totally you know? and i think i, I, I i'm proud that i can balance having a good time party and and be creative and get work done you know, and it's, uh, it's definitely, it can, it can go either way. You know, you can go out on the road and lose your soul. And next thing you know, you're just fucking going ape shit crazy. But I'm, you know, I think that's probably a good character trait. And I'm blessed to have a lot of wonderful friends that I keep in touch with and, you know, all over the world. And people you're say, good, you're good like that. that. You're good about keeping yeah, in touch. I agree. You know, people say what? People say you can count your close friends on one hand, but I disagree. You know, it's, I mean, uh, you know, you really just have to find the, the, the right people come into your life if you have the right attitude and the right energy. Yeah, and you I'm, really, the right good, energy I'm really good at, you know, keeping away what I call the chi vampires, the people that, you know, just want to suck your energy. Yeah, you have you to. No, it's a choice. And like social media is a weird thing because on, let's say Facebook, for instance, you can allow anybody to just come in your life if you accept their friend request. Mm -hmm. And I'm not paranoid. I can, whatever, I can accept it, but I'm not going to get caught up in the drama. I mean, if you have a hundred people that are just random friends that you haven't vetted, you know, 80 of them are fucking nutcases or drama queens or kings or whatever, you know, yeah. it just... And so it's amazing that people just allow this and then they get caught up in it and arguing on social media. It's like, who needs it? And that's part of the reason why I kind of stay away from it. But I, you know, I'm, I'm active with it sometimes, usually when I have nothing to do, if I'm busy working and gigging, you know, like the next two weeks, I mean, I don't really have time to be in Russia at a hotel room telling people I'm going to be playing in Russia. I'd rather <laughs> drink vodka with my friends in the band. And, uh laughing and telling stories yeah yeah you know i'm busy living not talking about it so tough questions uh most important thing your dad and your mom taught you hmm. well my mom i would say she taught me that life is short and enjoy the party you know mm -hmm. uh my dad you know he one cool thing he taught me when I was like 16, 17, you know, we look at women and we're trying to get in with them, right? Sure. Talk to them or whatever, have confidence. And he used to say to me, he goes, you know what? You're, you're intimidated by this beautiful girl over here in the corner. But he goes, son, look at the guys you're competing with right now. Okay, this guy's socially completely awkward. Look at the way this guy's dressed. Look at this guy. He goes, you play guitar, son, and you, 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 you're a good-looking kid. Go over there and chat with her. You're not competing with the women. You're competing with the guys. You already got it. Just go do it. What you a know, boost of confidence that was. Yeah, because he's right. You know, we we're like, feel like we're little alien creatures when we're 16, and he's like, son, you play guitar. Why don't you sit in with the band? And then I remember sitting with the band when I got done, the girl that wouldn't even talk to me prior to sitting in, she literally grabbed me by the hand as I walked off the stage and was wiping off the sweat. Oh my God. <laughs> it was at that point that I realized, you know, and my dad is so much cooler than me and my brother. He was like, you know, like Clint Eastwood cool, like mellow, 
you know, he looked like Sean Connery and he was just mellow and cool and didn't always have to say a lot. He was the guy in the room that would just kind of laugh at jokes if they were funny and people you know, loved his endearing laugh. And, you know, when he said something, everybody listened because he didn't have to say too much. You know, he was one of those guys. Very cool, man. Yeah. Two more, two more questions, Jeff. Anything you wish you did differently? Uh, you know, I always have regrets about uh, the band that I had when I was. Um, Edwin Dare. Edwin Dare, right. You know, and you know, allowing ex external people to come in. You know, I would I would have loved to had that band see the light of day, but it's all timing, and you know, uh, you know. I wish I wouldn't have signed the agreement I signed. <laughs> no, I've, never you know heard, I also, I've never heard I also that wish, I also wish we were, would have worked a little faster. We were kind of enjoying the fringe benefits of being, you know, famous in our little uh, bubble. Yeah. Back, you know, but we had the greatest of times and you do what you do. But um, it's interesting. I have an offer possibly with a, a record company to put that stuff out and maybe a new record. And I kind of want to do it because, you know, the other three guys are still around and it'd be great to do for my brother, Tommy. So do they play? Still? It's a long life and it doesn't have to just end, you know, do those guys still play? Yeah. Well, the bass player is the bass player in Cosmo squad. Right. Right. Kevin and the singer is semi-retired, but you know, he still got it. So I'm in talks with him and we'll see. It would be a dream come true. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. That'd be cool, man. But, uh, you know, and the record to listen to from that band would be Can't Break Me. And there's also two live videos. And, and uh, you know, I think uh, they're, they're, they're kind of cool. Pretty raw. Can't Break Me on like Apple Music? Yeah, you can okay, find great. it. Awesome. I think there's three different records on there. But that's, I think that's really the one. You Can't know? Break Me. Everybody check that out. If you like heavy metal, I mean, our bass player says, we're the best metal band you never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, last question, biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that has been intentional and how much is just a part of aging? Dude, I like those track lights up there. Very cool. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm just kind of walking around because my dog's outside. And track lights, we've got a nice view of the city, except for it's not clear today. Um, yeah, this is like a mid-century modern Eichler house. I don't know if you know Joseph Eichler. Don't. Houses in the 60s. You can look them up, E-I-C-H-L-E-R. and. They're cool. It's a lot of the glass, mid-century modern, atrium entry way. It's, you feel like you're outside even when you're inside, so you don't feel guilty. Of it's, being so, it's so yeah. weird looking at, every time I look at people in California, you know, it's, everything is mountains, and everything here in Florida is obviously flat. So it's really weird when I look at, at, at out someone's window there, nothing but mountains. Yeah. So not I mean, I can literally see through the Quanga Pass to downtown LA from my backyard. So That's great, know. man. Um, you know what, to answer your question, I don't know why I got off the subject there. Um, the, the biggest change in my personality would be fatherhood, right? Cause I've had kids in the last 10 years. And so, um, I don't know if it's changed me. I just, I think what it does is whatever ego trips you have and hang ups, you just take everything easier, even though having kids is way more responsibility. You look at them and it kind of corrects all the things in the universe. People that don't have children, some of them are just so into themselves, they get caught up in their ego. Once you have kids, like, you don't matter as much. And when you don't matter as much, because it's all about them, it kind of corrects a lot of shit with people, yeah. you know? Especially if you get along with your kids and they're on the right path with you. And, you know, it's wonderful. I see people that are just, you know, Self-employed musicians like myself that don't have kids and their heads up their ass half the time. They just don't get it. Well, you have to focus. You know, it's not about you. You're right. You can't, you yeah. know, if you think it's about you, you're going to be. Yeah. And once it's not about you, then you're kind of easy going and nothing. Every day is just great. You know, as long as your kids are healthy, you're like, fuck. I'm not so worried about, Oh my God, am I going to get this gig or do this? Fuck. I've, I've won the fucking grand prize. I got these two kids. Everything else is gravy. Anything else good that happens. It's just icing on the cake, you know? Well, with two girls, I hope if I speak to you in like three years, you're still feeling yeah. this way because yeah, you're, not, 
Dude, yeah. let me tell you, you're, you're about to enter the danger zone. They're really good looking children. <laughs> yeah, you're about to enter the danger zone, man. As and my mother in law says, God damn, you guys make good looking kids. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, very difficult, those you. Excuse me. Hey, can you grab that cat, please? This, my cat snuck in here. This cat is like. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> Sorry, man. Cat will tear down everything. Um, yeah, man, for sure. You, uh, good luck with that. Yeah. Hey, listen, uh, first of all, I, I really, uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate you being so cool and so open and sharing, uh, your past and, and all the trials and tribulations and all the highs and lows, man. And I really want people to, um, check you out and check out your music. It's Jeff Coleman. I would almost, I will guarantee or your money back if you don't like Jeff's music. You and that's with a K, right? Yes. It's not like, it's it's not like the cookers. No, I'm going to spell it. It's K-O-L-L-M-A-N, not Coleman, C-O-L. It's <laughs> Jeff Coleman with a K, K-O-L-L-M-A-N. He's got a website at jeffcoleman.com. But man, just go to Apple or whatever your Spotify, whatever you're listening to music on, or if you're buying it, God bless you. Uh, check out Cosmo Squad and check out his solo records. He's got a ton of music out there. And now it's, I'm going to go check out Edwin Dare, Can't Break Me. And um, he's also going to be out with Alan Parsons very soon. You can find tour dates on his uh, Facebook page at Jeff Coleman, K-O-L-L-M-A-N. And also he's on Instagram at Jeff Coleman. And he said um, he will actually post two weeks in a row if he gets a thousand more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like my page. And I, oh. I have a disclaimer of uh, apologies to, let's see, uh, <laughs> back uh got through <laughs> Frank and Bali, who i could never listen to uh, uh let's see that was, really funny. That was yeah. really funny um man thank at you for everything at all gods thank you for everything seriously man i really enjoyed i really enjoyed listening to music and i hope that we connect again and next time you got something new please come on the show i'd love to uh, showcase it man it's great right. stuff and i'm not blowing smoke Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks again to Jeff Coleman for spending time with us. Please support Jeff's music and check it out. Again, it's Jeff Coleman, K-O-L-L-M-A-N. Everybody listening to this that's a guitar player, I'm going to tell you right now, just go check out Cosmo Squad, the last record. It's called Morbid Tango. Heavy shit, great stuff. It's really good music. You'll love it. The guitar playing is just off the charts there, man. And uh, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out.